Welcome back to Restless. You've joined the boys, Father Joseph, Paul, and Joe. As together, we restlessly seek the face of Christ in the midst of today's crazy and mixed up world. And, you know, as a Catholic, one of the uh, craziest things that I hear from other fellow Catholics and either, you know, certainly from non-Catholics is kind of just miss- some misunderstandings about what the church is. And that's our topic today, because I think, you know, over the past year, if you've been paying attention to any of church politics or anything, you've probably heard of the synod and synodality, which really was, I think, kind of questioning and bringing into, you know, maybe a deeper understanding, hopefully, of the nature of the church. You know, what is the church? Is it human? Is it divine? Is it changeable? Is it unchanging? Uh, you know, what is the church? How do you define it? And and all of us are members, those of us who are baptized Catholics, but what does it mean to be a member of the church? What's its mission? Where are we going with all of this stuff? So... With fur- without further ado, let's just kind of dive right in. Like, what is the church? Like, if you had to define what the church is, what would you say? Um, I mean, the church is both a human and divine institution, right? So she is the spotless bride of Christ, um, but she's also made up of fallen human beings. And there's, you know, there's a tension there sometimes because, um, you know, we don't want to fall in the trap of defending everything the church has ever done or does do today or members of the church do, right? Because it's decisions are made by human beings, but ultimately it's it's guided by the Holy Spirit. And so we have to have an amount of faith and confidence in that fact, in the, in the, in the reality that the church will not fail ultimately, right? Even if its members are oftentimes desperately trying to fail ultimately. Yeah, that's that's tr- so true. So true. And I like that, you know, you use bride of Christ. There's so many different images in scripture. So throw out some of those uh, scriptural images of, of the church. Uh, Paul's looking confused. Come on, like body of Christ. Body, body, of, Christ. Christ. body of Christ. Body of Christ. Yeah. Sacrament yeah. of salvation is one of my favorite ones. Sacrament, sacrament of sacrament salvation. salvation. So what does that mean? Well, sacrament is a visible thing that we look at and can touch that points us towards an, it is an invisible reality instituted by Christ for the salvation of men, right? So in the world, just as Jerusalem didn't exist, or excuse me, just as Israel did not exist for its own sake, but existed to bring God to the world, the church exists not for her own sake, but to bring God's love to the world, right? So one can look at the church and see a society of Christians, the body of Christ in the world, living and working for their salvation, right? So the church is something we can see and touch and interact with and experience, right? That points us towards a heavenly reality. Okay. I like that. I like that. So it's a kind of a visible sign of invisible grace. Right. Absolutely. That's true. Yep. Well, the the, the, the church is defined kind of in the catechism by three different, three different units, which would be um, like the d- liturgical assembly, like when you say you go to church, so to speak, it also is the local community, but it's also the universal community of believers, all three things. Yeah, which I think is important because it's fundamentally a community and not so much a building. Right. You know, a building, yeah. building is secondary. You can go to mass. You don't have to go to mass in a building necessarily. No, I've had some great masses outdoors. Yeah. In waterfalls. Uh, well, not under the water. In, in the waterfall, yeah. That'd be <laughs> surfing down the waterfall. <laughs> the waterfall is beneath, you know, right. behind me. Yeah. Yeah, some beautiful spots. And uh, and I and when I was in college, actually, my home church burned down to the ground. Really? It was wow. shocking. Yeah. They were, they were putting on a new roof, and uh, someone left a hot iron on the roof and went to lunch, and they came back and uh, an hour later, and the whole do roof Do you iron roofs when you put them on? Uh, Is that a thing you do? Uh, <laughs> that's news to me. <laughs> that's not how that's Notre Dame iron. caught on fire, don't, I don't think, though. It no, hot, it's hot not. Iron. It was no. not a hot iron. I, I don't know exactly what they have to do to roof, but... Fair. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I was pretty devastated. I really kind of felt like like a member of my family had died. Sure. Like I was actually in Nebraska doing some mission work at the time, and I came back and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, you we, we were able to walk around mm-hmm. not inside of the charred remains, but all this stained glass has been smashed, so you can see through it and see, you know, even like the, there's a there was a really beautiful painting of the crucifixion behind the high altar. It was like eleven feet tall, twelve feet tall, and it was still there, covered in soot. And you could just see it through these broken windows. And it was just such a powerful image. It's like, wow, like, you know, the, the cross stands while the world burns, as it were. Was it a nice church? It was beautiful. Oh, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Did they Gothic replace it church. with something beautiful? Yeah, they did a good job, actually. Oh, they did, they okay. did a really good job. It's a very attractive modern church. Okay. So, like, lots of glass, uh, clear glass. Cause yeah. They, but they incorporated some of the stained glass they were able to save. And so they oh, incorporated that into yeah. the new church. And hmm. It's about three times the size, which they needed a bigger church anyway. That's good. So. Nice. So, so yeah, so it's not so it's less than a building and more of like a community yes. thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we should, we, we should, but it, we shouldn't also 
kind of degradate the value of the building itself. It's part of the church's mission is to have a physical presence as well. Yeah, that's true. Like it's good to have a physical, a beautiful physical presence that where people can gather. Like I think that's that is an important aspect of it's a it's an aspect of what we do. Sure. What is the most beautiful church you've ever been to? Oh, good question. Well, I'm going to Montreal soon, and I hear there's really beautiful churches there. Notre Dame, yeah, in Montreal. It looks it beautiful. I can't wait. Pretty jaw dropping. Yeah. yeah, probably the Duomo. I would say in Florence. 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 Yeah, yeah. Oh. Is that where it is? Am I? I don't well, know. Duomo, Never been. I don't the, the Duomo is the is the the central church in any given town in Italy. Right. So you have well, the, the Duomo the and Pisa. Florence, either way, the Duomo and Pisa. The oh, Duomo. Florence. The Cathedral in Florence was very beautiful. Yeah, okay. this is beautiful. Yeah. Nice. nice. The outside is more beautiful than the inside, necessarily, except for the dome. Maybe. You think the whole thing's beautiful? Yeah, I mean, my memory is that it was all beautiful. I was also See, in high school, so I wasn't super, didn't have a super discerning eye. <laughs> the, the problem is, is that when I think of, I always think of first all the not beautiful churches I've been to. <laughs> but I don't know, I think the, 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 was it the flagship church of the Jesuits in Rome, the Church of the Jesu? Jesu, yeah. Is like the epitome of Baroque, Catholic Baroque in the, at the time and I don't know. This this is stunning church. It is stunning. I don't the, like the renovation. I'll say they, they did a renovation. Sadly, yeah, it was. It's it's a little, most of the but. most of the original stuff is still there. There's also um, uh, Our Lady of Victory, I think it is, um, which is also in Rome, and it's much smaller than Jesu, but it's equally as like crazy baroque. Um, and then there's a few churches in northern Italy that are classic Gothic that are beautiful that I can think of. Um, those are a few. Also in in Stanford here, we have Holy Name. Which is a stunningly beautiful, beautiful even church. St. John's Basilica. Yeah. St. John's Basilica is, yeah, it's, it's, it's different. Very, very stunning. Yeah, yeah, those are all those are all great churches. Unfortunately, there was there, it was announced in my hometown that one of the churches is going to be no longer offer mass. I don't think they're selling it yet in Cheshire, Connecticut. It, yeah, and so one of the churches there, and it's not a shame. Oh, that's <laughs> it's, it's one of these churches that looks like Pizza an office Hut. building. Oh, office building. The, it looks like an office building from the outside. It's like very, very ugly, hmm. and so I'm hoping they do something great with it or sell it yeah which actually is a good great segue because you know you are seeing a lot of church buildings being closed consolidations yeah. things like that across the country and and one may say you know while if the, the church seems to be shrinking you know and so like what is the church's mission and what does the church need to do to accomplish that mission because i think a lot of people you know there's there's really kind of two camps here some one camp says well we need to just get as many people as we can regardless of what we teach or believe, right? And just kind of capitulate to the world a little bit, kind of buy into the zeitgeist just so people fill the pews or try with different um, tricks, tactics, you know, make mass entertaining, this or that. And then there's kind, of, there's kind of the other side, which is like, well, yeah, the churches are emptying out, but we're the true believers, right? So you kind of just kind of have like almost like a, I don't want to say ghetto mentality, it's too strong, but like a, a like, you know, we're the, we're the faithful remnant mentality. Yeah. Where it's like, it's just a natural kind of see a natural thing. And I think, of course, the truth is always in the middle. But I mean, what would you say is, what does the church need to do to accomplish? What is its mission and what do, you, what do you need to do to accomplish it? Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of I'm kind of a Benedict Option type of guy. And so... You don't have to explain that to our listeners. Yeah. So I, it was really popular about seven or eight years ago, but nobody really... Yeah. About yeah. About and I think... We did it. That's did, not true. I disagree that with that true. completely. Um, so, Some wow, we did. really attacked you there. Some people Joseph. did it, I'm sure. It, it was this idea that you you Six form people did it. It's... You form communities, intentional communities, usually centered around something that's very faithful. Either it's a really good parish or a school or something. Um, and you do what Saint Benedict was was they, he started monasteries and invited people in, offered hospitality, and around these monasteries in Italy form these faithful communities, and then they evangelized Europe from that. Basically, when Europe was not very Christian at all, these monasteries spread throughout Europe and really formed what we know as Western Christianity. Well, that's what kept the faith alive when the barbarians were really yeah. running everything. Faith, right. learning. Right. And and so, that, so then the idea is, like, can we do that now, especially in the United States where we have all these freedoms? Um, and I would argue that, especially in Lower Fairfield County here, we have a little bit of a Benedict Option community. We have phenomenal schools. We have phenomenal parishes where people are actually moving to. People are moving to this area just for our strong Catholic community here. Um, maybe it's not in practice. It's not like we have like a gated community. Um, but but that's it, good. That's yeah, not gated. No, and that's good. You know? Yeah, and I think that there's been attempts to do like gated communities, and it's not always. I mean, doing not Catholicism successful. well doesn't really seem to me to be the Benedict Option, which is what it's happening in Fairfield County. Right, like it seems to me, the Benedict option is a, a intentional withdrawal from the world for the sake of saving it later. 
No, I think, I think I think what we're doing in the Diocese of Bridgeport is just trying to be good Catholics. I think, and that's more the 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 spirit of the Benedict Option is that Rod Dreher had said in the book that you can't like it, you can't withdraw completely from the world. It's just we live in you have to be we have to be pragmatic about these things. Like we have to have jobs and make money and provide for our families and the church and all that. And so he right. says, this is how you do it while living in the world. You have to have walls, but the walls have to have gates and doors right. that you can let people in. Yeah, you know, because we are supposed to be a city on a hill. But if you ever go to a medieval city on a hill, you see that it's usually pretty well fortified because you you know there's going to be somebody or some things that wants to attack it. Yeah, you know, and that's uh, working at a, a very good classical Catholic school, which I would consider as part of kind of the Benedict Option movement here at Cardinal Kirk sure. Academy. Yeah. That's one of the great uh, tensions that we have is you know we want to invite in families that perhaps don't necessarily buy into the mission, but only so in so far as. We can lead them along because if they start changing the mission of the school and they start saying, well, we don't like learning Latin and we don't like you know, going to mass twice a week and we don't like all of this other stuff, then you know, that's going to water down you know, and it's not going to be an effective light to the nations. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the case. So, I think, so when you ask what can the church do, and I think – and you said we do Catholicism well, and I think that's part of the thing. And I don't think – so when you start you, – you would mention, well, should we just change the times even like doctrinally? And we say no. Um, or offer, make mass entertaining. And it's like, well, maybe, but in a different way. I think Catholicism, when done well, is naturally attractive because it it has to be, and it is. You see, when you have beautiful masses, people gather around these masses. Yeah. Um, When you have beautiful communities, beautiful families, like it's naturally attractive for us because it it is, because it was ordained by Christ. I feel like we can't can't, um, come close to, you know, a, a Taylor Swift concert. At mass, and we shouldn't try. Like some people were like, "Well, you know, let's just mimic our whether it's liturgical style or our mm. teachings on what the world does really well." But we we never come close to being that good, right? And so it's like it's a cheap knockoff of Taylor yeah. Swift concerts at mass, you know? Yeah, and and I always think of a lot about more like very reverent Novus Ordo or Latin Mass or things like that, or even a lot of people went to the go to the Byzantine right churches because they're also beautiful in a different way. But also there is like the the very beautiful way that you could see in a, in a more charismatic church. It, it can be done well, and that's attractive to people. But I think part of the attraction is the fact that it's very different. You know, it's not trying to cop the, the culture. It's right. trying to rather stand out from the culture and say, look, this is what we're offering. We're offering silence. Yeah. We're offering incense. We're offering things that you can't get elsewhere. I mean, I know that may have <laughs> some sort of illegal incense at Taylor Swift concerts. I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was funny. My... my um. My uh, parts of my we went to uh, Florida for Christmas, and parts of my family are Lutheran, and so they went to we went to their service, um, and then they came to the mass, and we went to this cathedral down in Florida. So it was actually the bishop was there, which prompted all types of questions. Um, but they had they asked some questions around because they had incense at the mass, and it was fairly reverent, and um, and the choir was decent for a Catholic choir. And and so that was good. <laughs> we so set the bound. The, it shows like the church. Is, so the church low. looked more like an office building. But um, in any case, so we we did that. But it's just funny when you ask these questions. But it does prompt like even this the the traditions that we hold in Catholicism that are done, which aren't necessary, but we do anyway. Um, they prompt a lot of questions, and it draws you in in a very particular way. Like, what is that smell? It's like, well, a lot of it's frankincense. Like, it's actually the thing that we're talking about tonight. You know, or in, in a week. So. Um, so anyway, I thought that was interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. And their service had a, you know, five piece band on stage playing loud music. And it really is a stage, you know, for a lot of yeah. I mean, non denomination brothers. They called and sisters. It, they called an altar. It very it looks like a Catholic church. I mean, this oh, church, if really? you were to walk into this church and you didn't know any better, you would think you were in a Catholic church. Mm-hmm. They actually have an altar rail. This raises a really important point, which is that um it's not a church we were talking about, a Lutheran. There's those just like like the, the Catholic understanding of what a church is that it's apostolic in origin and Eucharistic and 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 has sacrificial in nature. And so, it's actually sort of inaccurate to just to talk about Lutheran churches or Protestant churches. We would recognize Orthodox churches and Catholic the Catholic Church, but even the Second Vatican Council refers to them as ecclesial communities. And when we talk about churches, I think it's important that we preserve the identities of church as opposed like separate from what a lot of other religious. Um, you talk about building versus. No, I'm talking about no. Con- like there's from the Catholic perspective, there's no such thing as the Lutheran Church. Mm. There are Lutherans, but we would the, the the Catholic Church would not. I mean, I'm sure there are documents that say that that you refer to yeah. the. Church. I was referring to the building. No, I know, uh, yeah. but I'm I'm just I'm because you're talking about the difference in the way that they worship, and I think it's mm. important to just back up for a second and underline the point that there is the Catholic Church, there are Orthodox churches, but there is not a Lutheran Church really. I mean, there's what do we call it? An ecclesial communities, language of Vatican II. 
you can <clears throat> argue over whether well, that stuff's food. Church, right. so you can, are, interesting. Right. So you can <laughs> argue whether substance will be different or not. However, right. there is an important emphasis being made there, yeah. which is to recognize the authenticity of the Orthodox churches because they're actual churches, right? They're they're Eucharistic, yeah, yeah, no, sacrificial, yeah. they're apostolic. There's nothing apostolic or Eucharistic about the Protestant churches, and this is an important difference between us and them. That's a great point. No, I think it's important that there's yeah. something very unique about the Catholic Church, and we make a claim that I think is is rather you know it, it sounds bold to me, right? That that there's all the, the fullness of truth is found within the Catholic faith. That, the only route to salvation is through the Catholic Church. It, it, that is one of the dogmatic definitions of Vatican I, was no salvation outside the church. Now, obviously, you have to understand that rightly. Right. right. So how do you understand that? Um, yeah, I mean, the wrong way to understand that is that um, no person who has not received Catholic baptism or Christian baptism can be saved, right? Because it's not what that means. Right. But But... If the church is the body of Christ, which it is, that's not a metaphor, that's literally true, which means that Christ is the head of this spiritual institution, which is active in the world, extending his salvation outwards, it means that the salvation only comes from his body. Mm. Um, from it for, and that means from one's incorporation into his body, which in a sense we are because he took on human flesh, and so by our humanity we share something with him, but in a much more profound way by our baptism, which actually ba we're baptized into his sonship, right? And in an even more profound way when we enter into the actual fullness of the Catholic Church. So there's gradations of truth, which is what the Church would say, um, and so we sh one shouldn't like discount the reality of Christian baptism, outside, you know, not performed by a Catholic priest or deacon, for example. Um, but one also can't equate them or say that's the same thing to be an Anglican or well, um, or a uh, you know whatever as opposed to a Catholic because it's not true. But at the same time, an Anglican baptism is a valid sacrament. No, I'm not of saying baptism. it is. But I'm so saying that a... I'm saying even even past the reality of baptism, there is a fuller incorporation into the into the body of Christ that one enters into when they enter into the Catholic Church. Right. That's why when someone converts, we don't just say "Well, welcome" if they've been baptized. We actually have a ceremony to welcome them to the church. Yes, that's right? true. So that's um, very true. So yeah, no, I just again like. When we talk about church, like we can't reduce the Catholic Church to another church, which is to say, like another NCO or something like that, like um, or an, another, an NGO, another, NGO yeah. thing, yeah. <laughs> non commissioned yeah, officer, an NGO, yeah, yeah. what? An NGO. <laughs> like, like it's the church is the church is not just another organization active in the world. She is Christ, so she is His bride and she is His body, active in the world. And we can't just like it's important to like keep that in the center of the conversation because otherwise it becomes a thing like, well, you know, yeah. I'm going to believe what the Catholic Church says, but, you know, I want a better subjective experience of worship here or a better community there. But that's not the point, right? Even a, even a Catholic Church with the worst community and with the worst, uh, quote-unquote, performed mass is still a, in a more active and more real participation in his body. Well, know? because in the Church, it's Christ who acts and not us primarily, right? right Especially right. In, in every mass. I mean, it's, the mass is Christ's action. Which I think is really important because I, it drives me nuts as a priest how people are like, oh, I like Father So and So's mass. I don't, I don't like Father So and So's mass. I'm like, it's it's one mass, and I understand. I yeah, mean, I, mean, I mean, I think we could still have opinions. Like, I, I I agree, and I think that's I think that's kind of a negative downside to the Novus Ordo mass is that uh, the priest personality can shine forth a lot more than it could in in the old right. form of the mass, where really, I mean, a priest should be wearing vestments so that he disappears, so only Christ yeah. appears, and and. Really, the only time that a priest's personality should shine forth is in the homily. Yeah. There should be no other commentary. There should be no distracting things that a lot of priests do and, or, you know, bad sing-songing this or that or commentary throughout. You know, it's just, I don't know. Sometimes there's a lot of commentary. Yeah. Just say the black. Do the red. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, and I think I agree. I, I think it is, yeah. I think, it, I think it's important that we, I think it's important that we do notice that we do have, like, we shouldn't demand... We shouldn't demand uniformity, though, where the church allows diversity. So if you have a particular calling toward, like, an Eastern Catholic, you, you have whatever whatever reason, you're more oriented spiritually toward Eastern Catholicism, and you feel drawn toward that, I, I don't think that we would necessarily discourage you from going and joining, like, the local Ruthenian Byzantine Catholic Church. It's still the fullness of the truth. So I think that we can have that. We can have that here, Similarly, if you were drawn to the Latin Mass, like we have beautiful Latin Mass parishes, or a charismatic church, and you're drawn to that. Like I think we we allow diversity there, and we're not like the the Mormons will say like you have to go to your particular ward, you have to go to this meeting house every week, and if you don't go, if you go to somewhere else, like you're not allowed to. Yeah, and we don't do that. Right. Um, because the church is a body, right? There's different parts of the body that do right. different things, and that's okay. Yeah. Like, if I was good and essential, we yeah. can't all be the toe, right? Like, so. We have to all be different parts of the body. <laughs> so I think it's okay. Right. So I think when you say, like, I, I don't like the way this priest says, I think, I mean, if if you find something you do like, so to speak, and you invest into that community, I don't think there's necessarily something wrong with that. No, I, I hear what you're saying, definitely. Um, my thought is that 
you know, it kind of sometimes can obscure the action of Christ when we focus so much on the celebrant. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, um, the phenomenon of like destination par- parishes is understandable, but not ideal. Right. So in other words, there are some parishes which um, will kind of turn the trad dial to a hundred. Right. And we have to produce these beautiful <laughs> liturgies full of people from anywhere but the town that the church is situated in which is the exact opposite of what the church has in mind when it sets up parishes with, with, with uh, geographic boundaries. And so I just think that it's, and that's some of that on the priest, right? Like you should make a, you should want a parish that people can go to. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I do think that sometimes Catholics have to have a higher pain tolerance and I'm guilty of this too. But you know, if you, if you know, are unwilling to invest in your actual local church, local, local community, local parish, then it's not going to be surprising when it's only one good parish because all the people who are really care about improving a community are going to go to one place. It's like a, it's like a brain drain, right? So it's not surprising. And it, it is something worth avoiding, you know? Yeah. I understand going where, you, where you're going to be fed, but like to an extent, right? Because to an extent, you still have an opportunity to help your community to the extent that you can. And, and I've, I'm sorry, but I've always found that to be the most uh, ludicrous answer, oh, you know, I'm not being fed. Well, go on, go online and look up the church fathers. I mean, you can find anything online mm. to feed yourself. Now, I know you want to go to Sunday mass to get fed by a good homily. I get that. I you know. you also, that. well, I, I, I don't, I don't, yeah. There, there's, not even just there's a homily, a, just, just if you, if, I'm sorry, if you're going to a parish where the priest will never say mass correctly, then eventually I think I, I will tap out, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, I, yeah, no, I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the homily necessarily. I understand not everyone can preach. I don't chase around, uh, yeah, homily, I, but I, but I will, I do avoid parishes that I know I'm not going to get a good mass at, like a properly celebrated mass at. There are parishes that would be more convenient for me to go to for daily masses sometimes, like maybe midday or whatever, but I'm not going to go to them because I know I'm going to get aggravated when I'm there. Yeah. So no, I'm that's fair too. I know no mass is going to be solid. Yeah, and also the other thing is it, it, when we talk about community, I think it's, that's one of the three things. It's actually like a physical community of people. There is something where if the demographic demographics in your if you have kids, say you have four kids or something, and then you go to a, your your geographic parish where you live doesn't have any families for whatever reason, you want your kids to be surrounded by other children they yeah. can be friends with or whatever. So I think it would be that would be a situation where I would say like, yeah, you should you might want to go to a different perish i don't think there's anything wrong with that so i think there's a like i said i don't think we should be too prescriptive about that and i think destination parishes they start as destination parishes but then a lot of people actually move move there sometimes sometimes not always not always always. always. and sometimes especially especially in today's world where you can drive half an hour and it's no big deal yeah well it's also in fairfield county there's an issue where we just have costs where there might be a parish that's located in a place that's just crazy expensive and you can't, you just can't live sure. there. Yeah, can't that's it. definitely So true. there's an issue there too. Yeah, and, and it's not the case that in every parish those people were fleeing, if they were to stay, they could make a change. It's Sometimes true too, yeah, yeah. Transigen- yeah. But it's like a lot of those parishes could be improved by those people actually staying and, mm-hmm. and, and kind of fighting a little bit as opposed to, yeah. you know, it, it, this is not the same thing obviously, as someone who like abandons the Catholic Church for a church that they find yeah. checks more boxes for them. But it's not entirely dissimilar, which is like, this is your thing. So you should try to, you should try to improve. And again, there is no church to go to outside of the Catholic Church. So, But there is something about like, this is my parish. I'd like to improve it where I can. If I can't, then okay, yeah. I'll find another community. But well, I think that's just, an imp- just go to another one because the priest faces a different direction. I understand what you're looking for here, but like there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's, a, there's um, there should be some affection for what's your own. It, yeah, I think I think you hit on an interesting point that in, in today's world we have very much of a consumer mentality. Yeah, exactly and we can right. do that with parishes too. That this, but it's not a consumer; it's it's a family, right? Mm. Right, and and you don't abandon your family even if your family's crazy and you know, mixed up, right? Because I see that a lot in, in my parish, and that in that you know trying to get nowadays, and I've heard it was very different in the past, but you know I've only been a pastor three years, right? And But I've, I've experienced that it's been very, very difficult to get people to volunteer for stuff. Yeah. Really? It's, I get about 60% no's when I ask people to be yeah, a part of this or that. You got to expect about 20% of people are going to do 100% of the work. Yeah, and, and I'm purposely, tr- very intentionally trying to spread the, spread the mm. talent out, right? Because, I mean, there's a lot of people that really should be volunteering in your parish or this or that. Right. They've got the time, they've got, you know, the energy and the talents, but the but the mentality is well, Father, that's what we pay you for, you know. Mm, it's like you, that's a problem. I'm not going to do it. Or, yeah, or it's just you know, I come to get my sacramental things, and, and that's that's where it's just it, there needs to be a bigger fullness. And I think part of that is indeed the community aspect, but also yeah. part of it's like mature discipleship. If you're a mature disciple, you're going to want to give back. You're going to want to you're going to want participate in the mission of the church. Which, admittedly, if you're a layperson, the mission of the church, your mission in the church is to go and bring the gospel to the world to your job, to your neighborhood, to your sports team, places that I can't go. Right. But at the same time, as you know, as I look out on a Sunday morning and I see five to ten percent of my people who are actually serious disciples, there's plenty of evangelization to be doing in the pew next to you. Mm. That's mm. another really important point, which is that um <clears throat> it's great to have, obviously, 
you know, like um, internet, you know, cab catechesis and ministries like our own, like a lot of bigger ones like Bishop Aaron and whatnot. But it's also important to focus on the reality that there are a lot of, like you said, there are a lot of, um, what do they call them? Like, like um, sacramentalized non-verts or I've heard terms like that or just, you know. Whoa, what it, is it, that? Sacramentalized, sacramentalized non-verts. non-verts. Right. So someone who's like <laughs> sacramentalized, but is more or less entirely disengaged from the life of the church. Baptized pagans. Yeah. Right. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of people in our, in our pews, um, sometimes only a few times a year. Sometimes they're there every mm. Sunday, but that's it. Who really do need that evangelical uh, the evangelical spirit. And it's important to direct that locally, you know, um, because like, you know, the father Mike Schmitz is Bishop Barons. They produce a lot of content, which is great, a great tool for us, but it's just a tool. So if it's just a line, like it has to be picked up by those of us who are trying to be disciples and brought to other people. Yeah. And with our, along with our own experiences, our own affections for them, our own, you know, stories and whatnot. I think that it's just important to not only look outward from your own community, but look inward to your own community as well. You know? Yeah. I think I think also like what what can the church do? I think be unabashedly Catholic, be unabashed. It, it, like I said, it's naturally attractive. So be unab- And I remember my catechesis back in the '90s. Not that this was kind of the trend, so I don't really fault anyone. Was essentially go to mass on Sunday, be a good person, and you'll be fine. Yeah. And so what what do most people do after they hear that? They may or may not go to mass on Sundays, and they try to be a good person. Yeah. And so, like, they don't have the tool, like you were saying, they don't have the tools for that. It wasn't unabashedly, kept. there was no, there was very little talk about the sacramental life, there's no right. devotional life, all these, like, we have all these, there's Catholic churches, all these tools, right? All these, all these things that you can do, and if you, you can't do all of them, there's too many. Um, and so, we, it's such a great endowment that we have, and, like, using it to our advantage is is really important, and so that's what can a church do, and we are the church, so we can, we can do that. Yeah. I think to that end, like, um, the church is is perfect insofar as she is divine, but she's still made up of sinners who are trying to conform themselves more closely to Christ. Right. Right. So um, those two things have to be. So I say be, be unabashedly Catholic. Like, yeah, we're trying, we're striving for our own interior conversions, right? And we're working for that perfect, you know, we're trying to walk towards that perfection, even though Christ has perfected us, right? Um, and so, yeah, like just a, a striving for a true discipleship. Well, that's why, that's, that's why the church is always semper reformanda, right? Always reforming in every age. And we, we have that promise from Christ at the end of time that the church is going to shine forth in its holiness, but that's not the moment. That's We're not in that moment right now. You know, the, the church will be a spotless bride. Christ purchased that. And we, we even see that in the book of Revelation when, you know, we see this new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride prepared to meet her husband. Well, what is that new Jerusalem? It's the church in all its splendor and glory, yeah. how we're going to be in heaven, but we're not there. Sure. So mm-hmm. the church is messy and imperfect, and you're going to find pastors and grumpy people in the pews and this and that. I can be grumpy. Yes, I've seen Paul's grumpiness. Mm. Not here, though. I'm always joyful on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when he's not sarcastic or uh, always. <laughs> otherwise Never desultory. Sarcastic. Never sarcastic. Can you not be joyfully sarcastic? I'm always joyfully sarcastic, I think I'm Joe. often joyfully sarcastic, yeah. I am surrounded by the two most sarcastic people I know right now. <laughs> there you go. I'm not that bad. Am I that bad? I'm, no, you're not that I'm bad. I'm that bad. Joe is that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think sarcasm is a type of cynicality, though, so we have to, we have to watch it a little bit. And, yeah, it depends how it's interpreted, but yeah. Yeah. yeah how it's intended, I suppose. Yes. I tend more towards puns and myself. They're terrible. Excuse me. It's not, that's, not, it's not, that's not bringing out the beauty of the Catholic Church. Puns? Necessarily. <laughs> necessarily. But I'm a, I'm a father. I need to make dad jokes. It's true. You are. Sorry, that was another one of my puns. Yeah. That was pretty good. I thought that was good, though. That's Thank not you. a bad one. Thank you. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Yep. Well, this has been such a rich conversation. We actually ran out of time, and so we're going to have another episode on this. So tune in next time as we uh, dive deeper into the four marks of the church, one holy Catholic apostolic. How do we live that out? And uh, you know, how do we continue to build up the mission of the church? Because we're all a part of this crazy mixed-up family, the one that Christ promised would endure to the end. Tune in next time. 